Hello, everybody. My name is Kyle Clarich, and I'm a cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And we are here today with interviews with the expert. And it's my pleasure today to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Armin Argami, who is one of our esteemed colleagues in cardiovascular surgery. And we're here today to talk about the mitral valve repair. Welcome, Armin. Thank you, Dr. Clarich. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to have you, and I'm sure our audience is very interested in some of the topics we're going to cover today. And the first one is, when and how often uh, would a mitral valve be repairable? So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. How often is a valve considered for repair, and uh, what kind of valves are repaired? Good, good question. So when I look at this, I, I uh, break it down in two sections. One is when the valve problem is a, a problem of the valve itself. We call those structural valve disease. When the actual mitral valve, either the leaflets or the cords or something is wrong with it, those valves uh, most commonly can be repaired. Now, if the problem with the valve is not the actual valve system, but the ventricle, the pumping chamber, or other things around the valve that make it leak, then that's called a functional mitral valve regurgitation, which sometimes is better to be replaced. So in most cases with a structural valve, which is the more common form, a repair is doable. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so I think what I heard you say was that there are two kinds of mitral valves, those that are a problem with the valve and the second kind is a problem with the ventricle. And if it's a problem with the valve, that's a structural problem that those are often repairable. Right. But if it's a problem with the ventricle, it may be repairable, but they're often more likely to be amenable to a replacement. And I would also add, at least from a cardio a cardiology point of view, that we typically look at those problems with the ventricle as let's treat the ventricle first and see if we can get rid of the mitral regurgitation and then reassess. That's right. Yeah, exactly as, exactly as you said. The structural problem means the valve is not functioning well, so repairing it makes sense. That's great. And so you already alluded to the fact that the structural problems are the ones that you see most often in the operation uh, suites. So what do you think the advantage of a replacement over repair is in today's world? You mean repair over replacement? Sorry, yes, repair of uh, repair versus a replacement, exactly. Right. So, so repair is is it's a much better treatment of a leaky valve. Uh, every way you look at it, first the patient is going to keep their own valve. So the way they were born with uh, the structure of the valve is going to be uh, a, a living organism. So any, any prosthesis we put in, it's, it's foreign material and it's not a living structure. So this, this valve that the patient has, if you can repair their own, then it'll last longer. So all of our studies have shown if you repair a valve, it lasts longer than some of the studies even suggest longer than a mechanical valve, which is very interesting. And how long would that be? So you said it lasts longer. A repair right. would last, what, uh, 10 years, 15 years? Right, good question. So the way we look at it is uh, the failure at some at certain time, frame, time point. Let's say out in 10 years, how many of these repairs fail? That depends on the pathology of the valve. Now, I like to point this out when I talk to the patient is that for these structural valve repairs, it's actually not the repair, in most cases, it's not the repair that fails, unless, unless it fails very quickly, then that was a problem during the repair. But most of these fails are progression of the underlying disease. So the patients have a stretchy uh, valve, the valve stretches higher. And, and when they get to me, it stretched out so much that it started leaking. So I fixed the stretchy or a broken cord and I tighten the valve up and it's good repair, but I don't cure their stretchiness. So over time, they may stretch more and more and more. So when we look at these patients, uh, the most common repair we do is a posteriorly fed repair. And those patients, when we looked at them at 10 years, 95% of the time, the repair we did is still working. And only 5% of those patients have to come back for another procedure. So that's a pretty good 
and durable repair. We don't get uh, as good as that with anything else. And especially when they can be keeping their own valve. Correct. Yeah. So other things that you mentioned, other benefits are risk of endocarditis or infection of the valve is lower with this. Prosthetic valve failure is pretty much non-existent. You don't have a prosthesis in there. Some of the prosthesis you uh, requires aggressive blood thinning. Like if you take a mechanical valve, for example, you need to be on a blood thinner for the rest of your life. So with the repair, you don't have to do that. The multiple advantages. Um, the other thing is that we talked about the ventricle a little bit at the beginning. A lot of these prostheses uh, don't help the heart to retain its shape. Uh, and and uh, the, the normal mitral valve, the patient's native mitral valve, but the cords attached to the ventricle, not only the ventricle is holding the valve, but the valve is also holding the ventricle in a sense. So preserving those helps a lot. Well, those, that's a really good uh, reason to try to do a repair. So how can, how can repairs be done? Are there a variability of techniques uh, that uh, we've heard about the robot? We've heard about, you know, minimally invasive. And of course, there's the midstratotomy. Right, right. So again, I want to point out that at the end of the day, the patient should, uh, should seek a good repair. How it's done is secondary importance. But important in itself as well. Traditionally, it's done through the front by dividing the breastbone uh, and fixing the valve, putting it back together. There is a smaller, minimally invasive technique that's done through the right side with a smaller incision. And then to me, as being a robotic surgeon, I prefer the robotic approach, which is done through keyhole incisions, much, much smaller from the right side. You don't have to divide the bone uh, and no bone is actually divided. And, and it's done cosmetically better and, and less tissue trauma, faster recovery for the patient. We've shown that it uh, reduces the need for blood transfusion, lower risk of getting atrial fibrillation after surgery, a few other complications. And the patients usually stay almost half the time at the hospital and recover at home in half the time as open sternotomy. So those are the techniques, the, 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 the three type of uh, repairs. And and so I, I can imagine that most people would want to do the robotic repair because they get quicker recovery, less complications, and, <clears throat> and they don't have to split their breastbone and uh, the pain and transfusion risk is less. Right. Is there a difference in terms of the technique you choose depending upon the type of uh, repair you need to do? For instance, you know, sometimes we you you mentioned the posterior repairs are very durable, good repairs. Um, but there's we know that some patients come with anterior leaflet problems, and some mm -hmm. are having both leaflets, the anterior and the posterior leaflet of the mitral valve, that are causing problems. Would that inform you the way you would have to approach in terms of the robotic or minimally invasive or mid sternotomy? Very good question. <clears throat> In our hands, uh, and we've published this. The, the valve pathology does not play into the technique we use to repair, uh, the, the method, the approach we use for the repair. The technique differs, obviously. Um, so I, we do offer robotic surgery for all those pathologies you mentioned. Isolated posterior leaflet, isolated anterior leaflet, combined by leaflet prolapse. We can repair those. We've shown that the results are similar to open. But not everybody is a robotic candidate. That said. So uh, there is times that we do not offer robotic surgery and we have to do it traditionally. For example, one will be if the patient requires coronary bypass grafting. The coronary arteries that, that feed the muscle of the heart and the ventricle can get disease. Uh, and if, if they're a disease and at the same time of mitral valve repair, we have to do bypass surgery. In those cases, we do this in, in an open fashion because multiple things need to be done at the same time. But there are other things that we can still do it robotically. Like if they have a tricuspid valve regurgitation, in addition to mitral valve, we can do two valve surgeries. Or if they have atrial fibrillation, sometimes we do maze procedures or anti-arrhythmic procedure, and that can be done robotically. So that's not a contraindication. Well, that's fantastic. It looks like you can do most pathologies then with the robot, which is great, except if they have to have coronary artery bypass grafting. 
And then, and then that would be the one thing probably that I suppose that there's a problem with the aorta or something along that that was mm-hmm. also in, in the... Right, severe atherosclerotic plaque burden in the abdominal uh, aorta or the iliacs would also increase the risk of stroke. So we, we don't do that uh, robotically. We do that uh, midline. Patient's body habit is some patients have a pectus deformity when the breastbone is dives down and goes gets closer to the spine, mm-hmm. reduces the inside volume uh, for us to work. Those are a few exceptions that we try to avoid doing this uh, robotically. And that's all for the safety of the patient, obviously. Well, that, uh, thank you for that clarification. I think those are, you know, obviously very nuanced and every single patient needs an individualized approach to how we're going to get to their heart. But it does sound like the vast majority of patients would be considered for robotic technique and then we would uh, risk stratify those after we get the patient here and can look at all the different uh, imaging techniques that we use ahead of time to make sure that they're a safe candidate for the robot. Yeah, that's exactly right, Lessa. Speaking of risk gratification, uh, is there a risk involved with uh, the with the uh, mitral valve repair? Again, another good question. Uh, the risk, obviously, anything uh, a physician does or a surgeon does uh, does come with some small risk. But the risk of the surgery is extremely small. When we look at our data, is less than one percent risk of major event like dying. Uh, so it's not zero, but it's very very rare. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the fact is that the, the, the risk is very similar to, to an open technique. So we don't sacrifice any, any safety uh, for this procedure. That's fantastic. How many, uh, it sounds like you have a great experience here at Mayo doing these. What is the number of mitral valve repairs that you, we tend to do at Mayo Clinic in a year, say? We do roughly about 150 to 200 a year. Uh, we've done so far over a thousand uh, mitral valve repairs uh, robotically here. And again, as I mentioned, we've done it very safely. Well, that sounds great. So it sounds like most patients who come to Mayo Clinic for a mitral valve repair would be considered for a robotic technique. We would look at the their anatomy, whether they have high atherosclerotic burden, which may inform us one way or the other, uh, whether they're a candidate. But most patients, if they are a robotic candidate, would have very good results, durable results, with very low risk of uh, very unwanted uh, complications such as death or stroke. And that'd be less than 1%, which is great. Uh, that's exactly right. And to look at those, we... Uh, usually obtain a CAT scan, uh, a full body scan uh, to look at the atherosclerosis, look at the coronary arteries. Some patients may require coron- formal coronary angiogram to look at the coronaries. But we do this, we usually have it all stream- streamlined and, and patients basically come here a few days early and can get all these tests done and then have their procedure done the following day. Wow, this is this has been really helpful even to me in my practice. And I see a lot of patients with mitral valve repair. So fantastic, um, fantastic uh, discussion. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add to the discussion before we close? I wanted to thank you as well uh, for putting the time and discussing this with me. Thanks, Dr. Courage. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Argami, for your uh, very informative discussion and being our expert today in our discussion over mitral valve repair. Thank you.